Today we're going to start studying a brand new book of the Bible. We have uh, went through the Romans thing. All I wanted you to do, I picked all the gleanings out of it. And there's a few more things there, but uh, I wanted to get you started on uh, in this next one. We're in the book of Daniel today. So if you have a Bible, you might want to start there and do some reading. Read ahead because we're going to be there a long time. We'll be through the holidays probably in the book of Daniel. As we look at that great, wonderful, prophetic writing of, the, of Daniel. Listen, folks, this... This is the most, uh, I don't know, but I don't want to use the word interesting because maybe not, but it is the most profound, prolific, widespread book uh, in the Bible. I mean, it covers so many things. Daniel starts us all the way back to the beginnings of recorded history, and he takes us to the very end. He, we, he, at one place he will talk about the, the first king of the world, and he, and, he, and he follows all those all the way through till we meet the very last king of the world. And so we're going to be doing some widespread studies as we look through the book of Daniel. Often in Daniel, uh, it will seem to many people, and to, maybe to you, like a lesson in world history, because there is a lot of world history in the book of Daniel. And I don't want to uh, alarm you or bore you to death, but there will be a lot of looking at, at the progression of of the series of people that, that rule the world, mostly through Babylon's eyes and then Greek and Roman. He talks about all those, but we're going to be looking at them as we go through the book of Daniel. Now, before I start reading from the book of Daniel and teaching from it, let me ask some thought questions. And the first question is, can we be seeing the beginnings of the Ezekiel 38 war? Have you been watching the news? I begin to think we may be seeing a prophetic war beginning to start. If you're questioning what I'm talking about, read Ezekiel 38 this afternoon and uh, see if you don't agree with me. We may be actually on the verge of watching this thing happen. All right? I don't know. it. I'm not saying it is, but there's a lot of the players in line that Ezekiel talks about. A lot of the folks are lining up and Russia's getting involved in Syria. That's what I'm talking about. And uh, as they begin to uh, gather for a battle. Now, what I'm seeing, what you and I are watching happen is that Russia is joining in against ISIS. And we all say, well, great, you know, good job. Uh, uh, yeah. What have you been waiting on? And, and so there are things about what they're doing that makes me proud of them, you know. And I'm not a Russian, I'm, 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 but they're doing some things I've been, that need to be done. But I'm concerned about what will happen next. Uh, what will happen if an American and a, a Russian airplane fly into each other? What will happen if there's an accidental one? In other words, the two superpowers are too close together. Is what, what my worry is that we may see something scary over there during this time. Now, the Bible talks about Ezekiel 38. It talks about a war. Now, some are saying in, in this war, in this prophecy of Ezekiel 38, we see the Russian Gog, G-O-G. Okay, well, that, that's called Gog and Magog. The Bible calls them. And it says that he's drawn as with hooks in his jaws, drawn to Israel. So is something pulling Putin down with his forces into Israel, into the Middle East? Well, something's pulling him down here. And will history record it as having jaws, hooks in his jaws, dragging him down? I don't know. Uh, I'm not telling you this. This is it. I'm just saying we probably better watch this closely. Now, if, uh, if this is what's going to happen... Uh, he's going to target ISIS. Well, eventually, my concern is that he'll turn his forces as well as uh, the other Arab forces that remain against Israel. Now, that's my big concern. And that's what Ezekiel 38 talks about. How that uh, the Gog may God war will come against Israel. And by the way, if that's the case, and if that is what's happening, I, I'm concerned it will be nuclear before it's finished. And once that begins, where does that end? See, I don't know. Are we are we in that? Do we get caught up in that, or are we are we going to be left out of it? One of the things that concerns me about a lot of prophecy is that you don't find the name of America mentioned in prophecy. I, I don't. We're not there. I mean, you could one little phrase talks about the eagle that flew somewhere, and well, that could be us. Or the, the talk about the nation, the islands. Maybe that's. I don't know whether that's being described or not, but otherwise, we're not a major player in end of world events. Uh, so, this is concerning me because it could be that a nuclear 
a bomb will take us out of out of the the notion out of existence, and I dread to, I can't stand the thoughts of that. We want to pray that it doesn't happen. So when God gets finished here with, if this is the Ezekiel 38 war, God can make our war. When He's finished with that, <clears throat> Israel is going to be surrounded by the other nations, by Russia, Syria, and, and mo many other Arab nations will be coming against Israel. And nobody will be defending her. That's the thing that God may God more talks about. No one comes to her defense. And uh, if no one comes to her defense and everybody's going to beat up on her, it looks real serious, serious for her. But read the whole story. Because at the end of the God may God war, if that's what's coming, then you're going to see Israel comes out of it victorious. And she's going to regain all of her original boundary, all of her land. There won't be any more land that's divided up any longer. What God promised Abraham, Israel will take back over after the Gog Magog war. So I don't know. This, this, I just know this. These are the most exciting days to live I, that a person could live in. I'm so glad God let me live today to see this get this sort of things happen. Let's just hope that our military is strong enough to defend us uh, during this difficult time and through this fog of war. <clears throat> Whatever happens. I want to take just a moment and as your pastor, as, as the watchman on the wall, I want to encourage you to get ready, to prepare for some difficult times. I've been saying this for nine months to a year. I'm just saying it again. I don't want someone to go home and think, uh, well, the preacher never warned us about anything like that because I want you to know we live in times that things could really, really get difficult. Uh, we live in a time where it's easy now. We go to the grocery store, we go to the restaurant, we go to the McDonald's or whatever, we get our meal and we're happy, we go out the way. And, but what if we couldn't do those things? And what if there was such crashes in our land that, that, uh, that we could not do the normal things we do? What would you do? Do you have water? Do you have food? I'm just saying it's time to think seriously about protecting your family. And then finally, I think it's time to get ready to be a blessing. To be a blessing. I, I challenge people, I know a lot of preppers, and I challenge people who are preppers, don't prepper selfishly. Prepare to be a blessing for your family and for others. So that's just enough there. Let's move on. Let's talk about the book of Daniel. So get your Bible, turn to Daniel. Who is Daniel? Well, he's a, he is an elite, intellectual, spiritual, leading young man. And when we meet him first, he is uh, in the courts of power of Jerusalem. He lives uh, and works there with the elite. He's educated. Uh, he's artistic. He's, he understands literature. He understands history. He's probably one of the more, more well-educated people of his day. And there we find him in Jerusalem, a spiritual leader. He knows the Word of God. And we're going to watch this young man as we follow him from his 20s until his extreme age. We're going to watch his whole life as he goes through ups and downs, ins and outs, uh, good times and bad times. He's going to go through the fall of his native country, Jerusalem, Judah. He's going to be taken to a foreign country. We'll talk about that more in just a little bit. He's going to be there in this foreign country under the leadership of three different world powers. Daniel lives through the change of government of three major world powers. All that happened in the country of Babylon. They all happened right there. And he's sitting right and watching it all happen. And he survives it all and is uh, faithful through the whole thing. In fact, the lesson today, the sermon today, is going to be how can we be faithful through the difficult days that are ahead. And Daniel may teach us some wonderful things and encourage us about being faithful in difficult times and how to live through these very hard times. Daniel's going to use a term that, that we want to just throw out today just so you'll be aware of. He's going to talk about, metaphorically, horns. Horns. Now, he's a, going to interpret a vision. And in this vision, at one time, he's going to talk about, a lot, he'll watch the horns, meaning the nations of the world. Persia, or Babylon, the uh, Medo-Persians, the, the Greeks, the Romans. These, these will be horns. But at the very end of time, he's going to talk about a little horn. And this little horn is going to come up on the vision. And this little horn then is going to grow larger than all the other horns. Well, what he's talking about there is the Antichrist. 
And we'll get to that in days to come as we look through this. It's exciting for me to stand at the beginning of the book of Daniel thinking of, of what we're going to get to learn and read and study as we walk through it. I hope that you will that you'll commit to being a part of it and, and grow with us all through this study of the book of Daniel. For any serious student of prophecy, you need to understand Daniel. You're going to have to, to have it in your computer before you can understand the whole prophecy because Daniel is so full of information regarding the final days. Well, let's see. What, let me tell you more about Daniel. Here he is, a young man living in luxury and uh, uh, as, the, as a, a very important person, a VIP in Israel, in Judah. Well, their times change. Kings change. We're now under the rule of Jehoiakim. He's the king of Israel. And Daniel is there with Jehoiakim. <coughs> and the the Babylonians send up a convoy of people a couple of years before the, the, the war, and they, they want to raise or they want to tax Israel. They want a lot of taxation. They want, to, they want their money. And it's so much money that finally Jehoiakim says, no, it's done. We're not going to pay Babylon any more tax. Now the reason, it was kind of like when the, uh, the mob moves into Chicago. You know, they go into a store and says, Pay us, we're going, well, you have to pay us protection money. In other words, you have to pay to protect yourself from us. Well, that's what Babylon was doing. They said, you have to pay us money to protect us from us. We're, we're going to, if you don't give us this money, we're going to come whoop up on you. Well, that's what they did. And now, several years have gone by, and Babylon, uh, Babylon has moved their forces, their entire army. Well, a lot of their army, they moved to Jerusalem, and they have besieged it. They're going to take it by force, and they do. They take it by force. They destroy it. They, it's, it's horrible what they do to it. They take away... They don't take everybody back to Babylon with them. A lot of folks think they do, but they don't. They only take the elite, the ruling class, the uh, intellectual class, and the artistic class. And those are the, you know, the literature, the, the erudite, the people who study, who understand. They take the cream of the crop, and they take them to Babylon. They leave... The ordinary people, the farmers, and uh, those folks in in stasis there in in the in the in the area, they don't take them with them. So about 800 miles away uh, is Babylon, Babylon from Jer from Jerusalem, about 800 miles. And so they get them and they take the whole elite class of Israelis down to Babylon, 800 miles. It'd be a long camel ride, wouldn't it? And and the, and the bad news is most of them didn't get to ride on a camel. So it was a long walk to Babylon. How many of you are ready for an 800-mile walk today? Well, imagine the whole nation, the leadership, walked down through a desert all the way down to Babylon. And there for a, about a three-year period, they undergo a brainwashing. We thought, a lot of people think brainwashing is a new thing. Well, they've invented that. You know, the CIA invented that. Back few, no, 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 no. Brainwashing has been a part of governments for years and years. So they take the, those, these elite people and they begin the process of brainwashing them. And they change their names. They change their habits. They change their diets. They change their culture. They change everything about them because they want to brainwash them to, to cause them to stop being Jewish and to start being Persian or Babylonian. So that's a process that's going to go on. Now, today I'm going to lay a lot of foundation work for Daniel. Uh, so that as we study through this for the next few months, you'll be able to look back to some of these things and uh, draw on these resources and remember what we've talked about. The book of Daniel is like no other book in the Bible in that it is written in four different languages. When you read Daniel in its original form, you'll have to be able to speak Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, and Persian. It's written in four different languages. A little part would be written in Hebrew, another part's written in Greek, another part's written in, in Aramaic. Aramaic is the language Jesus spoke. That's his mother tongue. Jesus spoke Aramaic. And then, of course, then Persian, or the, the people of that one. So what this shows is, it shows that there has been so much time passed as Daniel writes the book, his book. So if there's a lot of things happening, a lot of cultural changes, just so you know that. Daniel writes in great detail. There's, there are people who doubt Daniel himself wrote the book of Daniel because it covers so much time and it is prophetic. They're saying 
Nobody could have been that accurate with their prophecy. Well, guess what? God is able to be accurate with His prophecy. And I believe Daniel wrote this. I, I always have, and, and I do still to this day believe this was written by Daniel, and entirely by him. So God knows what's going on. So let's come now to the situation. The fall of Jerusalem and the original city of peace. Let me share with you the name, some things, or give you. Let me set a couple of, of uh, goalposts for you to see here. First of all, we have Jerusalem. What is what is Jerusalem called? The city of David or the city of God? It is the city of truth. In essence, it is the city of peace. Its name means Jeru Yeru Shalom. That's how you would break the word up and say Shalom is the Hebrew word for peace. Shalom. Peace, brother. Shalom. And so it's Jeru or the Ye Judah, Jerusalem, Jewish, Yeru, peace. The peace of Judah. The peace of Jerusalem. So that's where they, they come from the city of peace and they go to the city of Babylon or Shinar. Now let me set the two goalposts. One, we have the city of God. The city of Babylon. The other goalpost is we have the city where the Tower of Babel was built. Babylon. Shinar. On the plains of Shinar, they built the Tower of Babel. At the Tower of Babel, what's significant about that? That is where the very first rebellion against God occurred. Now, we know the Garden of Eden was a rebellion of sin, etc. We know all the bad stuff that happened prior to the flood. But after the flood, the people came out of the ark. They reproduced. They, re they repopulated the planet. God said to them, spread out over the whole planet. Populate it, cover the whole planet. What did uh, Nimrod say? He said, no, let's don't do that. Let's stay together here on the plains of Shinar and we'll build a tower, a tower where we will we'll reach into heaven and we will, we will overthrow God and we'll rebel against God and we will do what we want to do. We won't do what He wants to do. So here we have it. The city of peace, the original city of God, now the Jewish people are in the original city of sin. The original rebellion. They're back down there. So those are the goalposts. That's what's going on as you watch this unfold through the book of Daniel. Read with me Daniel 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Alright, that's who we're talking about in Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. The king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged him. So Jehoiakim had been reigning for three years, and Nebuchadnezzar said, I've had it, you're not paying your tribute money, you're not paying you know, you're not paying your money to keep me from whipping up on you, so I'm gonna come and whip up on you and take your place. So we're talking now about the year six hundred and seven BC. If you want to put that in your in your calendar somehow, six hundred years before Jesus. So that's quite a ways back. We're, we're going way back in time. Jehoiakim was in power for three years. Uh, now, I want you to stay with me. I'm going to take you, I'm going to give you some history behind the history, behind the history. It is a little detailed, a little complicated, but if you will stay with me, it will bless you. So do your best to stay with me here. Isaiah, a hundred years before this happened, prophesied it would happen. All right, 100 years before Babylon fell, 607 years ago. So 710 years ago, Isaiah prophesied that 600 years ago, Jerusalem would fall. And I want to show you a little how that works because Bible prophecy is so good. Let me read to you what it says in Isaiah. In Isaiah 39, by the way. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah the king, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house... And all and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the place of the king of Babylon. All right. 105 years ago, before this, Isaiah said it would happen. And now it happened. 600 years, 670 years ago, it happened uh, before Jesus came. <clears throat> now, we have to understand that uh, this was a, a, an amazing time, but it is very similar to the days we live in now. That's why I, I think Isaiah is not just a book to be studied as history. And a lot of folks look at it and go, oh, here we go. 
the preacher's going to go back into history again, you know. But listen to me, I'm not, I don't want you to do that because this is as current as today's newspaper. This could be you. You can gain from this. As these people went through these difficult times, we may go through some tough times. And if we do, let's watch how they did it. <coughs> now, Daniel, excuse me, <coughs> Daniel was able to have a faith that lasted through all that difficult stuff. And so, what I want you to think about today is how can I hold on to my faith when things get tough? Okay? That's what I want you to think with me today. How do I make it work? First of all, I want to encourage you to guard your name. Guard your name. Nothing you have is more important than that. I'm going to read you some scripture in a moment that will prove that. That will say that. But your name is important. Your name means a lot. <clears throat> so I won't forget it. I was a part of a church, some, several church starts. But I've, I've, been remem I've remembered that when we started these churches, a lot of debate came up about the name of the church. What do you call it? What's it going to be? What are you going to name it? And I remember committees would meet. They would form one. They'd come up with a name. Another group would meet. They'd come up with a name and they would present names to the whatever. And I remember it dawned on me, it doesn't really matter what you call a church, what name you give it, because in time, that church, the name you give it, comes to mean something else. For instance, it's like, I call it like a cocoa bird. Anybody, anybody know what a cocoa bird is? <laughs> well, a cocoa bird rolls along, it just picks up stuff, doesn't it? And it becomes, after a while, it, it becomes wound up in wool and string or spider webs or whatever. And it, it becomes something else. It starts out one thing, it becomes something else. And so a church, whatever you call it, a name is a name is a name, it becomes something else. So what I want to say to you today, listen very carefully. Whatever your name is, over time, you've cuckolded your name to where it now means something else. It means something. When you say that name, it doesn't just mean, well, let's just use my name for instance. My name's Scotty. And you think of, well, somebody from Scotland. Well, I've been to Scotland, but I certainly am not, not from Scotland. My name is just a tag, just a, like a CB handle. Everybody ever have a CB handle? It's just a handle. But in time, it becomes something else. Okay, hold that thought in mind, because I'm telling you, as we move into difficult times, you must guard your name. Let's read it. Verse 5. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank. And the three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. And to them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. So, to, so what they did was to complete the amalgamation, the blending of them from Judaism to Persian, to Babylonian. They changed their names. All right, that's what happened. And, and I, I've told you the story about how our names change and how they can mean different things. But let's, let's go back in a moment. I want to tell you what Daniel means. Daniel's name means God is judge. He's my judge. Uh, Bel uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you're not my judge. God's my judge. That's what his name meant. Hananiah meant beloved of the Lord. Beloved of the Lord. Mishael means who is like God. It's a question, but it's, it asks the question, who's like my God? And the answer is, there ain't nobody like my God. And then you have Azariah, and his name means the Lord is my help. I'm going to ask you just to sit there for a moment and react emotionally to some names. I'm going to, I'm going to just mention some names. And I want you just to, to react emotionally. You don't have to say anything, do anything, nothing. I just want you to react to these names. And I want you to notice how you feel. And notice your reaction and your emotions when I say these words. Are you ready? Billy Graham. Richard Nixon, Abraham Lincoln, Bill Clinton. What did you feel as I went through just that short list of names? Did you feel emotion changing and swinging? And at times you felt proud and 
tall and strong. And sometimes you felt kind of, I heard a snicker or two even when I mentioned a few names. Yeah. So what about your name? Does your name mean something beyond how you pronounce it or what it stands for or its idiomatic translation? What, what, is it, what does your name mean to your family, to your community, to your church, to the Lord? What does your name mean? It's very important. Proverbs 21 says, A good name is to be more desired than great wealth. Far favor is better than silver and gold. The rich and the poor have a common bond, and the Lord is the maker of them all. Proverbs says, The name of a righteous is used in blessings. The name of, of the wicked will not be used in blessings. Uh, a good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of one's death better than the day of his birth. A good name is is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. I guess I want to say, keep your name, keep your name meaning something wonderful. And it can. Or you can turn your name into a curse. The second thing I want to tell you is keep your commitments. Keep your commitments. What you say you're going to do, do it. If you say you're going to live with a person for the rest of your life and to be faithful, do it. If you say you're going to pay a bill, pay it. If you say you're going to be on somewhere on time, be there as best you possibly can. Keep your commitments. We live in a world where commitment means nothing. We literally have, have thrown commitments out the window today. And we've got to come back to that. The people of God must become people who keep their word. And that's why the world thumbs its nose at us and says, Oh, I don't want what you got because you're not keeping your commitments. You don't, you're not faithful in anything. Well, we have to keep our commitments. Verse 8 says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Here we are, Daniel. Take him down to, to the Persian cup, Babylon and he's going to be brainwashed. So he said to the head guy who's doing the brainwashing, the head eunuch, he said, look guy, look, I, I want you to know I'm a kosher Jew. We've been trained, we've grown up eating a certain food, a certain way, prepared, prepared a certain way. We, we don't, we don't uh, uh, make things like you do. We, don't, you know, we're, we eat kosher food the whole time. So he said, I, I want to keep doing that. And the, the, uh, the head you know, said, no. He said, if I do that, and you guys look puny at the end of the trial time, well, I said, I'll lose my head because the king told me to, to train you. And, and he said, okay, Daniel said, here's what we'll do. Here's the deal. Let's take ten days. And me and my boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we will eat just kosher food. That's all we'll eat. And you let everybody else eat king's food. And at the end of the time, let's try and see what happens. Well, as you guys know, at the end of the time, not only did they look as good, the Bible says they look better than everybody else that was in the trial. And so that's how this worked. They, and so they boys got to keep their commitments. They got to keep what they had promised God they would do. He said, what do you mean promise God? Well, as a Jewish boy, you you took that, you know, you promised God. You made commitments to, to be raised Jewish and eat Jewish and marry Jewish. And you had to make those commitments and they kept them to God. And so I turn now to you today. And I'm going to say, that no matter what happened to Daniel, even if he was taken from his home, he kept his commitments. My daddy had a way of saying this that it, it really cut right to the chase. And he said that he had a whole bunch of boys, four of us. And he'd say, boys, commit, uh, our person's name or our person, person's character is what he does when nobody's looking. Have you thought about that? Your character is what you are when nobody's watching you or nobody's evaluating you. It's what you can do when no when when you can do anything you want to do. What do you do? Do you do you keep your commitments? Do you remain faithful? Or do you go off on a tangent or do a sinful thing? What do you do? Well, a commitment is kept whether you're in Jerusalem or in Babylon. It's all the same. 
whether you're in with some, whether you're around your mom and dad, or whether you're by yourself, whether you're around your spouse, or whether you're by yourself. A commitment is a commitment is a commitment is a commitment. Do you see where I'm going? It doesn't matter where you are or what's going on. A commitment is a commitment. And God's people must be people who keep their word. Daniel taught us how important that was. I want to close with this thought. In verse 9, because the third thing I want to tell you today is it's important that you go and be and become what God wants you to be. or what Go only where God is going or where God is leading. Only go there. Because God guided Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He guided those boys and He protected them and He took them through and kept them safe. I love verse 9. It says, Now God had brought Daniel into the favor of the goodwill of the chief eunuch. God was guarding Daniel. Why did God guard Daniel? Because Daniel was such a good guy? No, not really. But God guarded Daniel because his word, his name meant something, and his commitments meant something. God knew that he could put him in a place where he could be trusted. Can God put you where you can be trusted? Has God given you a responsibility and authority? Well, no. Well, maybe it's because He can't trust you. If you want to be somebody that God can use, God, somebody can, that God can trust, then you keep your name, keep your word, keep your name, and keep your word, your commitment. Those are two things that absolutely are a must for believers. Whether we're in a, a time of peace or whether we're in a time of war. No matter what, those things are so important. I'm going to challenge you today. Let's turn this thing around by keeping our name and keeping our word.